Good morning, folks. My name is Stan Goldberg, and <clears throat> I'm going to talk about something that probably is difficult for many people, and that's death. The hardest problem I'm going to have here today is, is staying behind this podium, because I'm told they're videotaping it, so I can't move around. So if you see me trying to move, it's because that's what I'd like to do, but I'm told I can't. Death is like that embarrassing relative you never want to show up at a family gathering, but he always does. And he sits there in the middle of the room demanding your attention, just like death does. The uncle, the, this embarrassing uncle, um, makes your life miserable, and death is something that you end up fearing. Stephen Levine wrote this marvelous book in 2009 called A Year to Live, How to Live as if This Year Was Your Last. I looked at that and I thought, well, I think a year is too long. Um, it might be better to reduce the, the duration uh, to give you less wiggle room to figure out what's important for you. And narrowing the, the choices does that. When I started as a hospice volunteer, uh, there was an exercise that our trainer, who was Frank Ostaseski, if any of you are, are familiar with the hospice community, you know Frank, he's, he's a pioneer and a, and a leader in the area. But he had this exercise that we all thought was gonna be pleasant and easy and mild. And he, he gave each of us, I think it was either seven or 10 cards. And he said, what I want you to do is write the name of someone important to you on each of these cards. And we thought, oh, that's nice. We can at least take the time. We can figure out why we like someone, why we want to be associated with them. And then we did that. And then he said, now I want you to kill off one of them. Well, you know, if you, all, if you had 10 people that you listed and only, by the way, that's my granddaughter, so she can stay here. <laughs> If you listed 10 people and you thought, well, okay, you know, it's, this isn't too painful. I'll, you know, I can get rid of this last person. And, and for me, it was, um, it was a colleague at the university. So I thought, well, you know, I'll miss him, but, you know, he's not that important. It's okay. And I leaned back and I, you know, said, you know, this, this, this is okay. I can deal with this until he said, now I want you to eliminate another card. And we knew what was happening. He was going to have us continually remove one of the people who was important to us. And in the process, we had to choose what was important and who was important. It was an exercise that caused virtually everybody, including myself, to not only examine what was important in life and who was important, but also the, the type of immense grief that we would feel when one of these people was eliminated. Hi, Matea. Okay. The, narrowing the, uh, the frame, the, the time frame, um, increases, or, or, or what it does, it, it makes choices much more relevant. But even though you've narrowed it down to, let's say, one day, how are you going to choose what's really important to you? Well, there's different things you can rely on. You can think about what your personal preferences are. You can look at your past history. You can ask, you know, you can look at the experience of other people, or you can search for some wisdom from some of the great minds. And I chose to do the last. Okay. This is Rebor Rinpoche. He was a Tibetan monk who was imprisoned by the Chinese for 10 years. When he was released, the Dalai Lama, who was his student, told him that he should go to the West and to Europe to lecture, to introduce people to the notions of, of death and dying. And, and that's what he did. I attended a workshop that he ran. Uh, in, this was down near Santa Cruz area. And as I sat there and he started talking about different things, it was almost as if there was this a bombardment of wisdom that was coming out. And I couldn't write down fast enough 
the, the things that he was saying. And each one of these impacted on me and said, you know, th these are very important things. When the session was over and I went back to my room, I looked at, at this laundry list of incredible things that were said. And I said, you know, I've, these sound familiar to me. You know, I think I've read these, about these before. And it was confusing because, I, you know, he kept quoting a lot of Tibetan and, and ancient Buddhist texts, and I hadn't read any of them. I said, so why do I know this stuff? So I started looking at it very carefully, and I realized that for many years, I had been including all of these whiz statements of wisdom in my writing, in my articles, in my books, and I thought, my God, I plagiarized from the Buddha. You know, th there must be a special place in hell for those of us who do that. And I began to realize that what was occurring was somehow I was, I was the receptacle for these incredible thoughts, thoughts that I had always taken credit for myself. You know, it was a very ego-boosting thinking. You know, you've, you've came up with this wonderful idea. And in fact, all of the good ideas were not mine. These were things that had been said and had been practiced for years before that. And I started looking at, well, you know, what was the context? How did I come up with these ideas? What was going on in my life? What was I writing about? And what I realized is that the ideas were coming from difficulties, from different uh, problems that were occurring in my life. The first one was a, a prostate cancer diagnosis in 2002 where, the, prog where the, the prognosis was guarded because of the, the stage of the, the prostate cancer. And from not really caring about issues of death and dying, um, I became very concerned. And all of a sudden, that embarrassing uncle was someone who was going to live with me for the rest of my life. Following that, I became a bedside hospice uh, volunteer. I did that for eight years. Uh, and from those encounters, you know, a whole series of, of ideas, you know, came to me. And again, I don't take credit for any of these. What, what I saw happening as people got closer to dying was there was an incredible sense of honesty that arose. You know, as, as we go through life, we accumulate defense mechanisms. You know, always we have to be appropriate. We have to make sure we don't hurt somebody. When someone is getting close to death, None of those are concerns to them. It's almost as if there's a shedding away of all these defenses that they developed their entire life. And what you're left with are, are words and ideas and emotions that people have that are mind-boggling in terms of their honesty and in their insightfulness. Um, for 12 years, uh, I was a caregiver counselor. And if anybody here has, has not done caregiving, you're in for a treat. Caregiving is, is one of the most difficult activities um, that I, I can imagine. In caregiving, you've got the interest of the person who is the caregiver with the person who is being cared for colliding. And you have to make, you continually have to make decisions on are you going to take care of your needs or the needs of the person you're caring for. And in that nexus of competing needs, what tends to happen is you, you get to, to realize really what things are important in life and what things aren't. So there was a lot of the, the things that, that Reba Rinpoche had talked about I was seeing in, uh, in the people that I counseled. For 30 years, I was a communication counselor. Uh, I was a professor at San Francisco State, and when I was there, besides teaching, I did therapy with clients of, very, of different types of disorders, different severities. The demographics were all over the place. And I kept seeing a lot of these ideas reoccurring, whether it was a, a, a mother who couldn't deal with a child with a language problem, someone with aphasia who lost their ability to speak. But they kept reoccurring and made me think, there's something here that I really need to understand. Um, I've been a family caregiver. 
And as a family caregiver, what I've been able to see is all of the things that I've counseled my people, you know, the, the people in the past about, uh, were now coming down and I began to understand them from the perspective of a participant. Okay. So you, you haven't heard any of the suggestions yet of what, you'll make, what will make your life better and your death easier. If there's anything, any of these that I talk about that you find to be, that resonate with you, they're not mine. You know, they, they, these are these eternal ideas that just keep filtering down. If you find some that stink, I'll take full credit for that. Th those are my ideas. A lot of the ideas that, that kept reoccurring um, were ones that were very commonplace. They sound very simple. And, you know, some people might even call them trite. But these are guidelines for living. They, they can take the, the simple form of something like the golden rule, which is do unto others and you would have them do unto you. You can look at any of the, uh, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, and you'll see them separated out and, um, you know, in, in different forms, you know, for millennia. My favorite is one that my mother said to me on my first day of kindergarten, which was, be kind and don't hurt anybody. And to this day, it's something that resonates in, in almost everything that I do. Okay, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm behind on my slides here. Um, so again, anything that, that you find doesn't make any sense, it's mine. If it resonates, um, it's original and I won't take credit for it. Can these eight suggestions change your life today? Yeah, um, I, I believe it can. Are there others that can do the same thing? Of course, I'm just not familiar with them. Okay, so let's look at, at the very first one. Something that came, that continually came up um, throughout the various experiences I've had. And that was the, the, the importance of focusing on the journey. Now, people who focused on the journey had an easier time of accepting the losses and death than those clients and patients who were goal-oriented. There's a, a, a mythical figure in Buddhism called the hungry ghost. Now, the hungry ghost is this really distorted figure. I don't know if it's a man or a, you know, a half man, half animal, but he has this enormous descended stomach and a small head and a mouth the size of a button. And the, the message there is what he does, he roams the world looking to, to feed himself. His, his appetite is insatiable and he can never get enough. So there are, there are people who, who live that kind of life. I had a, a patient um, who was a well-known journalist and he was credited with changing the face of, of journalism in World War II. And I went into his room one morning and you know, it was totally disheveled. You know, he had pulled things out of the closet. The drawers were turned up. He was looking under the bed. I said, John, what, what are you looking for? And he said, the manuscript. I said, what manuscript? And he said, there's a manuscript that's due tomorrow at the publisher, and I need to find it to send it in. And I said, no, I'll help you look. So, you know, I went through all of this rubble, everything there, and couldn't find anything. And, but he, he insisted that it was there. And I said, John, you know, your, your friend Martha's coming in later this afternoon. Uh, just, if you can just lay down in bed and rest. And together, she and I will, will look for it. So he did, and she came in to visit. And I told her the story, and I said, you know, he can't find the manuscript. And she said, what manuscript? Uh, he hasn't written anything in 10 years. And she went on to tell me that his whole life, what was important to him was the, the accumulation of things that he wrote. He took no, no pleasure in the actual writing. He took no pleasure in, in any of the ideas. But for him, what was important was the total number of goals. Um, he, lived, he lived a life and he died 
as a hungry ghost. This is about my favorite quote about journeying. Happiness, and, and this is from the Buddha, so I'm not plagiarizing. I'm giving him full credit. Happiness is a journey, not a destination. Work like you don't need money. Love like you've never been hurt. And then my favorite part of this is dance like no one is looking. <laughs> These thoughts, you know, sound simple, and, and they are, but they've, they've reoccurred in throughout history. Um, in 1600, you had the Japanese poet Basho wrote that every day is a journey and the journey itself is home. Arthur Ashe, the great tennis player, said that success is a journey, not a destination. The writer Ursula Le Guin said it's good to have an end to the journey, the, the journey toward, but is the journey that matters in the end. And my favorite is John Lennon's song, Borrow Time, where he f talks about the importance of enjoying what you're doing as you're getting to a goal. Okay. So, what to do? How do you focus on the journey? Well, there's different ways of doing it. For me, I use music when I feel that I'm so caught up in goals, I'll sit down and I'll pull out one of my flutes and I will just play it and focus on the notes that, that I'm playing. Um, athletes do the same thing with simple movements. If any of you have ever watched Steph Curry right before a game, he'll stand right behind the three-point line and he just continually feeds those shots, you know, and he's focusing just on that movement. Um, if you wash dishes, just focus on each dish as you do it. If you're a gardener, as you weed, think about each weed that you're pulling out. If you're a walker, think about each step that you're making. The takeaway, and I, I, I like the idea of a takeaway. Takeaway means I'm giving you something that you can use later on. So hopefully these are all takeaways. And the, the takeaway is if you focus on the journey rather than the accumulation of goals, you'll have an easier time accepting losses and preparing for your death. Okay. The second thing that, that kept reappearing uh, in, in all of the, the, these adverse situations that I was in was the importance of asking for forgiveness. Clients and patients who ask for forgiveness tended to be more peaceful whether or not forgiveness was granted, than others who felt guilty about unskillful behaviors and never asked for forgiveness. It was the asking and not the receiving of forgiveness that was critical to many people. So how do you ask for forgiveness? Well, the first thing that you want to do is you want to identify something that you did that was unskillful. There's a wonderful story about, about an old monk, and he was having much, he was having difficulty remembering. So when he would come back to the monastery at the end of the day, the abbot would say to, say to him, was this a virtuous day? And he would think about it and he said, I don't know, I don't remember. So the abbot said, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you two little sacks one sack will hold white pebbles, and the other will hold black pebbles. When you do something, think about whether it was virtuous or not. If it was virtuous, take out um, a white pebble and put it in your pocket. If it was less than virtuous, take out a black pebble and put that in your pocket. At the end of the day, count your whites and count your blacks. If you had more whites than blacks, it was a good day, it was virtuous. If you had more blacks than whites, you know that you need to do something different the next day. When you ask for forgiveness, do it directly. Think about what you did during the day and what you would need to do to make it right. The takeaway here for number two is just the act of asking for forgiveness, whether you receive it or not, is beneficial.
the third one, offering forgiveness. Clients and patients who offered forgiveness began the healing process not only for themselves, but for the person who hurt them. This is a, uh, a picture of the wife um, of my best friend, the ex-wife of my best friend from college. Um, she was dying from ovarian cancer. Those are her two adult sons sitting next to her. About two weeks before she died, she asked her sons to forgive her for being a terrible mother. And it, it shocked both kids because, well, that they weren't kids, they were adults at this time. Shocked them both because in their, in their eyes, she had been the perfect mother. There wasn't anything that she did that required to be, you know, required forgiveness. Um, so they kept saying, but mom, you know, you were perfect. We don't need to forgive you. And they thought that would be enough to make her feel better, but it didn't. And she kept insisting that they forgive her, and they didn't know what to do. Uh, my friend called me to ask my advice, and, and he, what he said to me was, there were things that she did that were terrible, that the, the, her children didn't know about, and she didn't want them to know about. What could he do? And my suggestion to him was, let your sons know that the next time she asks for forgiveness, you forgive her regardless whether you think that she needed it or not. When this picture was taken, you may not be able to see it, but she's smiling. This was about a week before she died. Everything had been cleared out. Her sons forgave her, and she was ready to die. Okay. In Shakespeare has Portia uh, asking in the Merchant of Ventus, or saying in the Merchant of Ventus, the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It's blessed him that gives and him that takes. Quite often we refuse to forgive someone because we, we feel righteous indignation. We feel the person doesn't deserve to be forgiven. What they did was so horrendous. There's a Tibetan saying that we can throw hot coals at our enemy, but in the process, we burn our hands. Okay. So, so how do you go about offering forgiveness? Well, when you're asked to forgive, forgive. You know, don't worry about it. Just forgive that what that person has asked you to, to reconsider. Not forgiving can be more destructive to you than to the person you don't want to forgive. I worked, I served a, uh, a woman um, who was living at home, and every time I came in to see her, she would begin the conversation with this terrible thing that happened to her. And she would describe, because she had been a teacher, and she would describe as a teacher how all the other teachers would ostracize her, would make her feel terrible. And after about a year of being at the school, they eventually decided to welcome her. And by that time, she was so indignant over the treatment she received, she refused to forgive her. Well, I heard this story every week. And after about the third week, I said, when did this happen? Because it was so vivid in, in her mind. And she said, when I was a student teacher, it was 50 years ago, you know, prior to this time. And you know, the anger that she had towards them and not forgiving them had pervaded her whole life, according to her daughter. Her daughter would say that, that she was an angry woman. She, from the very time that she, she could remember, her mother was angry. And she attributed, and so did I, to the fact that, that this sense of righteous indignation had been eating on her for 50 years. Okay, the takeaway here, you will begin to heal when you offer forgiveness, as will the person to whom you are making the offering. Refuse to forgive, and your anger will remain indefinitely. But sometimes, as much as you want to forgive, 
you can't. Certain things seem to be beyond forgiveness. And when that happens, the important thing that I've found in, in the people that I've worked with is, is working towards understanding. Uh, when patients and clients couldn't forgive, their anger was reduced by understanding why the hurtful behaviors were done and directed towards them. Um, a lot of that I learned also. I learned from my, my parents and their, uh, the rest of their family. We had um, 33 relatives die in Auschwitz. Three survived Dachau. These are all on my father's side of the family. On my mother's side, we didn't know how many people died. She grew up in a, a small town in Poland, came to the United States before the Holocaust began. Uh, but there were people from her village that were sent to Buchenwald. Now, Buchenwald wasn't a traditional concentration camp. It was a work camp. Surrounding Buchenwald were over 100 uh, factories and industries that were served by the prisoners in Buchenwald. I was delivering a paper in, um, in where? Prague. I was delivering a paper in Prague, and I found out that Prague was only a two and a half, three hour drive from Buchenwald. So I said, well, you know, I want to go there for two reasons. One is in, in a way of reconnecting with family that I never knew. But the second, and for me it was more important, was trying to understand how something like Buchenwald could ever occur. Now, when I got there, the, the, the city of Weimar is only six miles away. So people who lived in Weimar knew what was happening in Buchenwald. They knew it by the, uh, the, the prisoners that were marched to, you know, through the, the town to take care of uh, the bombed out areas. They knew it when they came up to the camp and bought pork from the guards and they saw what was going in. They knew it from the ashes and the smell that came, that drifted on Weimar every Tuesday and Thursday when the, when the, the crematorium was, was lit. So they knew what was going on. So it was never going to be an issue of them denying it. But what I wanted to know is, explain to me how this could have happened. What they spent time talking about was understanding the circumstances behind the rise of Hitler and, uh, and, and you know, uh, the Nazis. Um, my parents didn't want to understand. They had no interest. My mother even, you know, I remember I, when... when my wife and I were first married, we bought a Volkswagen. And she was appalled that I would even think of buying anything German. And for a while, she refused to even ride in it. So for her and, and the rest of my family, uh, the anger and the inability to not understand what, what, the, ri what, the, what the cause uh, for the rise of Hitler was, uh, was devastating. And it was something that stayed with them their entire lives. Okay. So how do you go about understanding? Well, the first, thing, the first thing is realizing that events never occur in a vacuum. There are always events that precede it and lead to it. The second is understanding, trying to understand, is not the same as forgiving or condoning. Understanding is something you do more for yourself than the person or the situation you are trying to understand. The takeaway here is if you can't forgive, then try to understand. Without one of the two, anger will spill over into other parts of your life and make your death more difficult. Okay. Anybody know what I just did? Double click on the slide. Okay. 
or some current slides. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, I'm just going to keep moving on here. I think we only did that. The fifth thing is let go of what you can't change. What I found is that when people were able to let go of losses, their lives improved and their deaths were easier. Holding on to something that you no longer can do is a recipe for unending grief. And I'm much better now at, at letting go than I had been, but there was a time when that didn't work very well. F following my, my, uh, my diagnosis and the removal of my prostate, um, I had to undergo a series of treatments that reduced my energy significantly. And there were things that I knew I couldn't do anymore. I had always looked at myself as an avid outdoorsman. My love in life was fly fishing alone in the wilderness. This was a part of me. This was a part that this is how I identified myself. I now knew I couldn't do this anymore. And the question became, what do I do now? Well, I did what most people do when they lose something significant. They pretend they didn't. And I went off and, and I tried to, to fly fish by myself in remote areas. Um, the one time that I did it, uh, I, was, I had been hiking in for three days and I fell down a small cliff. You know, um, I sprained my ankle and I knew that at that point I couldn't get out. And there'd be nobody there uh, to find me. And my wife could eventually say, see, I told you so. But after I, fortunately there was a stream at the bottom of, of the, uh, the cliff area. I put my foot in it and I was able to, uh, you know, to get the swelling to come down and eventually got out. Well, when I made my way out, you know, uh, I, was, I ended up being more angry that I couldn't do this than realizing that this was no longer appropriate. So what I started to do is try to figure out what it was that was so important to me about fly fishing in the wilderness. And I thought, am I missing that specific behavior? Am I missing standing in the stream? Or is there something that was beyond that? And I came to realize that what I missed was not the specific activity, but rather the emotion that it generated in me. And for me, that was serenity. That's what I was searching for. Well, I could have tried to substitute this wonderful experience uh, by trying to modify the fishing experience. I could have, you know, bought myself a beer cooler, a folding chair, a can of worms, and sat down on the side of a bank and tried to fish. But I didn't do that. That wouldn't lead to serenity for me. But what did was I found that crafting and playing flutes did that for me. So for me, you know, I was able to recover the emotion even though the activity was no longer there. How do you go about letting go? Well, the first thing is you need to accept your loss. Now, too many people confuse accepting a loss with thinking about being defeated. And it's not the same. Accepting a loss means you're now willing to adapt. You're willing to look at, at what's real and figure out what you can do to make that the best situation you can. The second step is you need to look for the emotion that you lost. For me, it was serenity. That, that's the focus I took. I worked with a, uh, a woman who was a professional dancer and had a degenerative muscular condition, and she no, could no longer dance. So for her, we figured out together what was most important for her was creativity. When she would dance, she would feel creative. She would invent new moves and new, new, uh, new dances. She couldn't do that anymore. And she was able to find creativity in becoming a gourmet chef. You know, very different thing, but it was creativity that was important for her. Uh, I also worked with a, an individual who was a Fortune 500 executive. And, for, and a, as his heart condition progressed, he was really no longer able to, to work in, in this company. For him, 
what was most important was a sense of, of contribution. So what he did was he found a, a youth group and he started to teach them organizational skills. Okay, so the takeaway, we don't grieve the thing, the person, or the ability we lost. We grieve the emotion that's associated with it. Don't try to hold on to what is no longer present. Recreate that treasured emotion. The sixth is offering thanks. Offering thanks for a kindness shown to you can change your relationship with that person. It makes the person thanked feel valued, and it acknowledges your own vulnerability. If anybody has been to ACT in the last 40 years, the gentleman sitting there with a strange costume uh, is familiar. That was Dean Goodman. Uh, Dean Goodman was a very well-known actor in the Bay Area, and um, I was assigned to him. First day I met him, uh, walked into the apartment, and he was in the process of giving things away. Uh, one group would get the furniture, another group, he had books, he had plays. There was many things, and he was just giving things out. After he introduced himself to me, the very next thing he said was, what are you doing on Wednesday at 7.30? I said, well, I don't think anything right now. Any, any particular reason? And he said, I'm going to be throwing myself a goodbye party, and I want you to be there. He said, why should I wait until after I'm dead for people to tell me, you know, how wonderful I was? I won't hear so I'm going to have a party, and you will be there. And I said, of course. The party was held at, at ACT, and um, it was this unbelievable event. You had, there was lots of champagne, there was caviar, there was all kinds of exotic appetizers. Uh, and I recognized a lot of the people who were there, as these were many, many of these people were on, on television and, and were in movies. Uh, at about a half hour or so into the, this party, uh, music came on, and the door of the elevator opened up. And there was, there was Dean in that costume, surrounded by, by people who wheeled him out in the chair. And all through the evening, people would come up to his side and tell him what a difference he made to them. And they, in turn, said the same to him. Um, it was an incredible event. It was one of the, the most gratifying moments I ever had was to watch what was occurring there. When I saw him the next week, you know, I asked him what he felt about it. And he said that it was the most moving thing he had ever participated in. And if he knew that it would be so wonderful, he wouldn't have waited all these years to throw himself a party. So the, the takeaway, when you thank someone for a kindness, you are saying that you value them as a person, and you are willing to expose your vulnerability, a weakness that requires the help of another person. What to do? How, how do you go, how should you go about being thankful? Well, I think one of the, the issues is we tend to wait. We wait too long to tell someone how much they meant to us. Don't do that. You know, if someone does something nice for you, acknowledge it. Let them know as soon as you can. When you thank somebody, don't just use the words. The words are great. To hear someone say thank you for, for doing this or doing that but offer an explanation. Why are you grateful? What was so, so wonderful about what they did? Uh, and so that's also important. Okay. The seventh, there's a total of eight, so we're getting close to the end. The seventh is what I call complete unfinished business. Clients and patients 
who believed that life had their life had many loose ends, had more difficulty dealing with adversity, losses, and their death than those who felt that they had cleaned their plates. Sometimes the, the expression of loose ends was very literal. They would talk about specific things that they needed to do before they died. But other times, and actually more often than not, it was metaphorical, as it was with, with my client. Um, he lived alone with his wife, who had had a stroke four years prior to me meeting him. And she, at that point, was she couldn't communicate, and she had limited under, ability to understand. Once a day, his daughter-in-law would come to visit. And so she would prepare the meals for the day to make sure things were clean, do whatever needed to be done, and then she would leave. She came in one morning, and at this time, he, most, most, of the days, most of the day he spent in bed. And she went up to his bedroom, and he wasn't there. She had no idea where he was. She started scouring the house. She couldn't ask his wife because she couldn't communicate. And the question was, where was he? The last place she looked was the basement. And in the basement, there he was, up against a shelf with all of these jars of nuts and bolts and washers, and he's rearranging everything. And she says, Pop, what are you doing? And he said, it's too messy here. It's much too messy. I need to take care of things. So she thought it was the early stages of dementia. And so she you know, it was very kind and very gentle and, and got him back up and lay down in bed. She took care of everything, left. The next day she comes, can't find him again. This time she knows where he is. And she ran down to the basement, and there he was again. I mean, th this guy was in very fragile health. Uh, he had uh, bone cancer. And, you know, th there was lots of, of issues involved with, his, with mobility with him. So, you know, she was frightened that he was out of bed. And there he was, once again, on the shelves. And she said, Pop, what are you doing? And he said, it's still too messy. I need to complete this. It has to be arranged. So this time she thought, maybe he's trying to send me a message. Instead of thinking that, that, he, that he had dementia, she said, why don't I help you, Pop? Let's do it together. So for the next 20 minutes, they rearranged. It was, it was you know, a meaningless rearranging of things. It didn't make any sense. Um, but he, when he finished, he felt very comfortable, and he was able to go back up, and he never came back down again. According to his daughter, from the time his wife had a stroke, there were many things that, that he had to leave unfinished. And his whole life was this whole set of, uh, of loose ends. Okay. So what to do? How do you go about cleaning your plate? Well, Think of your mind as if it is a hard drive, a computer hard drive, with just a limited amount of memory there. Well, you, you get the new hard drive, you don't have too many programs on it, and you're doing things and it zips through and it's no problem at all. But after a while, you keep adding programs, you keep adding data and files, and although the, the computer is running, it doesn't run as efficiently. It starts to run slower. If you have a Mac, you eventually get what, what is known as the color wheel of death that just keeps spinning, that indicates that you know, things just aren't working as well. What you need to think about doing, and, and it, was, it worked for my patients and clients, is you need to start clearing out that clutter. The more cluttered you are, the more difficult at our age, but I see most of the people here are about the same age, the more difficult it is to focus, to take care of things that, that are important. You know, I, I always think about finishing all of these unfinished things as analogous to taking, having an enema. You know, it's not a very pleasant experience. Neither is, is finishing up all of these loose ends. But how do you feel in the end? That, that wasn't intended to be a pun. <laughs> How, how do you feel when it's over? You feel good. You feel you've, you've, you've cleaned yourself out. The same thing, I saw the same thing happen uh, with my clients. So the takeaway, your ability to deal 
with difficult issues can be reduced by having to deal with, with fewer loose ends. If you want a more efficient and, and be more efficient and effective, clean your plate every day. Okay. The eight and the last one is the notion of creating a legacy. What's the definition of, what's the definition of a legacy? Well, for me, it's, it's very simple. It's knowing that you made a difference. Simple as that. You made a difference in your life. Unfortunately, most people think of legacy in big terms. So, you know, if you are uh, an Ellie Wiesel or a Mother Teresa, you know, you have your, your legacy will last generations. But what about the guy who's homeless, out on the street, without friends, without family? What will his legacy be? I had a patient who fit that description. And um, as we spoke, he would, he would lament that when he is gone, there's, there will be nothing at all that will reflect on his life. And it was something that was making his, his he knew he was dying. It was something that, that made this whole transition to death very difficult for him. What I did was, every time I left the bedside, what I said to him was, thank you for allowing me to be with you. What you have said to me and what you have shown me are lessons that not only will affect my life from this point on, but they will affect the lives of other people when I tell them your story. Well, for him, that was a legacy. Okay. What to do to create a legacy? Well, the first thing is to think more broadly about what a legacy means. Think about it as something that's enduring, not necessarily fundamental or substantial or great, just enduring. It could be as simple as, uh, as doing office work for a cause. You can, you can you know, do things that are that you, from home. You know, those of you who have physical disabilities or you know, other kinds of health issues, you, know, you can do things that will create a legacy for yourself in your own house. Okay. So, so here, in just a quick summary, because we're running out of time, these are the eight things that I found were beneficial in not only creating more meaningful lives for my patients and clients, but also easing their deaths. And they weren't things, and I take no credit for any of this. These were things that sort of came through, and I'm just sort of compiling them. So the first was focus on the journey. The second was ask for forgiveness. The third was to offer forgiveness. The fourth, understanding what you can't forgive. The fifth is to let go of what you can't change. The sixth is offer thanks. And the seventh is complete unfinished business. And the last one is create a legacy. Do these eight things and I think you'll find that your life will change. Mine did. And if my patients were, were right, your deaths will be much easier. Many years ago, when I was, I was 40, about 40 at that time, and um, my life was in the toilet. And I didn't know how to get out of it. I didn't know what I needed to do to change it. I questioned my, my competency as a writer. I questioned my compassion as a, as a parent and as a husband. And I thought, I need some way out of this other than drugs. And uh, I thought I would go to the, the Shasta Buddhist Abbey, which is in Northern California. And I thought, maybe that's where I can get enlightenment. So what I did was um, I, I registered for the weekend. And the first day, the abbot said, is there anybody here that would be interested in counseling? I think my hand was the very first that went up. So the next day, um, I went into this room, and I'm waiting. You know, I thought, okay, I'm finally going to find a way out of this mess. I'm going to be enlightened. Everything will be fine. And in walks a guy, could be no more than 18, 
And now I'm going to sit and tell him about my life? Here was, and he, you know, he, again, he looked like he was 18. I'm sure he had never been married. I don't know if he ever had a relationship. He didn't have children. And I wasn't even sure he was old enough to shave. But here I was going to tell my life to this individual. So for the first 10 minutes, you know, I felt uncomfortable. And eventually, I didn't, you know, I didn't care. And everything just started coming out. I was telling him things that I had never said to anyone, things that I barely even was, was aware of. So after about 30 minutes, I was finished. And all during this time, he's sitting in a lotus position with his eyes closed, shaking his head. And he opened up his eyes and he said, Stan, we do the best we can given the circumstances of our lives. And with that, he got up and left. And I thought, <laughs> I've just shared things with this guy, and he comes up with this inane saying? And then I thought about it for a while. And, and I realized it was probably one of the wisest things ever said to me, other than my, my mother telling me to be kind. And I thought, you know, you could apply that to so many other things. You know, we do the best we can given the circumstances of our lives. So this is now called the shameless plug. Um, you know, we obviously didn't have time to go over a lot of the, the, the issues in depth, but I write about all of these things, and you can find them um, on my website, stangoldbergwriter.com, and on that website, there's over 200 articles on aging, dementia, end of life, many issues. They're all free. You can download and share them. Uh, I also write for VeryWell.com, and I've been designated as their caregiving expert. So once a month, there's a new article that appears there. Um, my latest book, uh, which is Loving, Supporting, and Caring for the Cancer Patient, there's uh, over 260 very specific things that can be done um, you know, to help those of us who are living with cancer. The book prior to that was Leaning Into Sharp Points, which was another book on caregiving. And the first of this series is Lessons for the Living, uh, which is my memoir of being a hospice a volunteer for eight years. Um, okay. So, conclusions. I'm going to leave it at, at that, the saying from the, uh, the, the youngster who listened to my impassioned pleas. We do the best we can, given the circumstances of our lives. And if you're not able to do these eight things, to include them fully, it's okay. You know, one is better than none, more better than less. And uh, don't beat yourself up. You're doing the best you can, given the circumstances of your life. Thank you. Thank you.